this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're talking preparedness with the scientists who wrote the Hawaii Handbook on how to prepare for natural hazards. And we talk to the emergency information managers about what you need to know to keep you and your family safe during disasters. First, we're at the Central Pacific Hurricane Center talking with meteorologists to learn about how they forecast and what they do during hurricanes and tropical storms. We're at the National Weather Service Honolulu Forecast Office and Central Pacific Hurricane Center, which is located at the University of Hawaii at Manoa campus. On a daily basis, there's about four to five forecasters working, and they work 12-hour shifts, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. During an emergency situation, our numbers surge from about four to five forecasters a day, upwards of about 10 people working. So we've got everyone handling the normal operations, then we have a hurricane forecaster in here, then we've got people that are handling the media phone calls. We've got people handling the public phone calls. We'll have a forecaster that gets stationed down at the emergency operations center. So it gets it gets all hands on deck. And have you personally been through a hurricane? I have. I grew up in Miami, so I went through Hurricane Andrew when I was really young. There was trees down everywhere. Our house, luckily, our roof was still on. Our next door neighbor didn't have a roof anymore. All of our pine trees fell down. One fell onto our roof. And how does that experience impact what you do on a daily basis here? Well, it's just a reminder that it's really that one storm that impacts your life. What the forecasters are bringing is that local knowledge of how things actually work in Hawaii. The computer is still just a math problem that's trying to time step forward. You add your expertise of knowing how things generally work here. Like anything, the more years you add to it, more knowledge you're going to learn about your area. What kind of um, education background do you need to be a meteorologist in your field? To work for the National Weather Service, you have a class requirement list that you need to take to be a meteorologist. A lot of physics classes, a lot of math classes, Classes, and then a lot of dynamics and thermodynamics classes within the, a meteorology or an atmospheric science program. What I want to share is that you should be prepared and you should listen to all of the advice that you can find, the good advice you can find, the right <laughs> advice you can find. So that means coming from the forecast offices and coming from your emergency managers. So the information the emergency manager puts out on evacuations, that type of thing, that's what you should listen to. Next, John Bravender shows us how he monitors weather and predicts storms. The display system we have here are called AWIPS, Advanced Weather Information Processing System. We, we love our acronyms. Uh, pulls in every bit of weather data that we can find. We can look at computer model data. So we have satellite, radar, observations, uh, whether from airports on land or ships at sea or aircraft flying through as well. We, we get that all in here. Geostationary satellites that you might see on TV news, uh, also polar orbiting satellites in low orbit that uh, can pick up more finer scale details, as well as weather balloons that we launch from, we do two, twice a day weather balloons from Lihue and Hilo, as well as across the world at the same time. And that gives uh, an idea of what's happening in the atmosphere right now. And then we can look at the, what the computer simulations do, taking that forward in time. That helps us choose which future solution we think is most likely. Even verification, we, how those models have been for, performing in the past, we, we can look that up. Normally, we would see tropical cyclones tracking south of the state, moving east to west, south of the islands. And then occasionally, one might recurve, like Iniki did in 1992. With warmer ocean water, one thing that we started to see over the past few decades is those tracks shift poleward, meaning in the northern hemisphere they're shifting northward, putting Hawaii at greater risk of one of those east-west moving hurricanes impacting us. Not all hurricanes behave the same. West moving hurricanes, like Hector last year, had a much smaller than average error. We were much more confident in the track that it took, just based on the large-scale steering flow and, and what was expected to happen. Happen. Confidence is much less when you have a recurving hurricane, like with Lane and like with Iniki, at what point it makes that turn, because it's interacting with large-scale weather systems, ridge, trough aloft, and when it makes that turn is highly uncertain, and that's one thing we struggle with, computer models struggle with, and that's the point where you really have to pay attention, um, be prepared just in case. 
based on the official forecast, we run a, a Monte Carlo simulation with a, a thousand different realizations, trying to take into account sources of error. Maybe the hurricane's bigger than forecast or smaller, stronger, weaker, faster, slower, uh, things like that, that, that could change with the forecast. And try to capture that in a quantitative sense. Uh -huh. um, so within those thousand realizations, if, if you take a point and say 400 of those thousand realizations have tropical storm force winds at this point, then you have a 40% chance of tropical storm force winds. And that's how those wind speed probabilities are derived. And it's also how the time of arrival graphics that we have are also derived from these simulations. What do you do? How do you prepare yourself and your family? Knowing that during a, a hurricane threat like this, I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna be very busy. It is an imperative that, that I have a, an emergency plan ahead of time. So we're not running out to the store last minute. We have food, we have water. So we don't have to worry about that and keep focused on the job here. I'm a little interesting situation because I live on a sailboat. Our hurricane preparedness plan is to go and stay at my wife's office. We, we've lived on our boat for, for 13 years uh, since we moved here. And last year during Hurricane Lane was the first time we really enacted the full plan. I left for work one morning and <laughs> like, I kind of turned around like, I might not see this again. And thankfully Lane stalled and fell apart. But it's important that you have that plan ahead of time. So you're not trying to make those sorts of decisions in the heat and in the stress of, of the moment. University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. Welcome back. We're talking with John Cummings at the Department of Emergency Management in downtown Honolulu. John's role is to provide emergency information to the public in times of disaster. When we talk about disaster preparedness for our residents, you need to have a plan, build a kit, and be informed. A couple components are things like having an alternate gathering area if you can go back home, like a park or, or a building. Second one, uh, which is uh, really important to me, is having an off-island contact. And what that is, is everyone in your family carries a name and contact information for someone living outside of Hawaii. Something happens, uh, like an earthquake, uh, I can't get home, I call home, nobody's answering, the phone's down. Everyone in my family group calls off island and checks in. So I'll know within a few days where everybody is. If you have someone in your home who's elderly or they have special needs, uh, special medical needs, you have to think about 14 days of being without those supplies. And that's your food, water, clothing. Things for like for my dad, special dietary needs. If you have children, toys or games for them too. And pets. We have three cats and my friend's dog lives up the stairs and downstairs, right? We have to plan for their care too, emergency food for them. Because they're your family too, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of our homes are older. A lot of them uh, were built before current hurricane standards, mm -hmm. really cold, right? And they're at risk from, from winds, even from something as simple as a category one hurricane. Especially if they're on an exposed ridge line, a uh, single wall home. Uh, my dad's house was built in March of 1941. I've had the plan for the fact that a house probably will not be there after a bad hurricane hit. Last year, first time ever, we had to exercise our evacuation plan, take him and his dog from his house, bring it to our home in Pau'oa, shelter in place while I went to work. We had to do that twice, first time ever. You know, being in this business, I've, I've had to think about these things along with my job. Uh, but it's something we all have to think about. You know, what's going to happen to where I live if we're impacted by a hurricane, tsunami, or flood? Whatever planning you do for 14 days is good for any emergency that's going to impact us here. Having some shelf-stable, uh, non-perishable foods that don't need cooking. Ah. Yes, that's kind of key too. For me, that's a lot of canned goods, uh, energy bars, uh, energy drinks are good to have. Hurricane season, going to hurricane season, I have a set uh, of foods and things that come May, all the food from last hurricane season, we incorporate into our menu for this coming year. And then I go and replace them. My alkaline batteries, I replace those every two years. So you've got some supplies out here to show yeah. me today. Now you can buy commercial water like this. Uh, 
this is 14 gallons of water, this is 14 gallons of water. This is enough water for one person for two weeks now. And it's heavy. Water is very heavy. Uh, so you know, if you have to run out to the store buy this, you've got to lug it with you, right? Uh, for, I keep empty containers at home like these. And when we get to a hurricane watch, so fill up the containers. I have other containers at home we fill up too, right? Uh, if we go to a hurricane warning, uh, the last thing we fill up before the electricity goes out, remember no electricity, no pumping water, right? And we go to this little guy here called Water Bob. Mm. Yeah. And that's a liner for your bathtub. Yeah, and once we lose electricity, which could happen before it even makes landfall, we can pump water. So whatever container you have in the house, go ahead and fill it up. That helps you, even the little bottles, right? Uh, what the Water Bob does is gives you now a food grade liner to provide you with instantaneously portable water. Well, you could drink the water out of the bathtub. It'd be probably best to uh, boil it, treat it, or filter it. But with this guy here, it's ready to drink right like that. A single-use container, so for us, we wait until it's warning and before electricity goes out, and then this is the last thing we fill up in the house. And the last part of being prepared is having some way to get information. You know, when the hurricane is coming, it's TV and radio, right? And your smartphone alerts and apps, right? And once the hurricane is on land, it comes, electricity goes out, Really, the only way we're going to talk to you through emergency management is through a simple AM radio. So like this one here, which has an internal battery that's cranked to, to charge it. You can also put it in the window and it'll charge with solar battery, solar power. It has AM, FM, and weather channel radio, and it can charge your cell phone. Oh. Now, I, I like, I'm, a, I'm a gadget guy. I like things that have multiple uses. And this covers a lot of different fields in one little, one little package, right? The last one we have here is a NOAA weather radio with specific area message encoding. What this is, you set it up in your house, it goes on a standby mode, and anytime there's any type of severe weather warning in your area, it'll go off. Yeah. And then some light. Yeah, of course. Uh, an important thing is having some type of lighting. Uh, and spare batteries, or they even have generator powered lights now, though, which, which are really good too. You don't have to worry about the battery storage. I know you've been thinking about disaster preparedness for a long time, it's your job. What are the things that still keep you up at night? If we get a hurricane or tsunami, we're gonna lose our harbors. We're gonna lose our airports. We're gonna lose our coastal roads. If you live uh, far from an urban center, it could be days to weeks before you see anybody coming into your area to provide assistance. Uh, if you just take a few minutes every week to talk about it and plan for it, it may be that your plan is, well, we gotta leave our home and go to my, 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 my mom's place. But at least you know now and plan for that. Because it could, you know, there's, uh, it, could, it could get really bad here. It's not a matter of what, if it's when, and that's, that's the reality. Can you tell me places that people can go to learn about what might impact them in their location? When we're talking about tsunami events, uh, one of the best tools for knowing if you're in a tsunami evacuation area is a phone book in, in your house. Uh, we've been putting maps in that since uh, the late 80s. Uh, each island has a, a map in their phone book. Those maps are also available on our website at honolulu.gov forward slash dm. If you want to look at if your home is in a uh, FEMA flood zone, if you go up the, to the Department of Land and Natural Resources, they have access to the FEMA flood hazard assessment map. Uh, NOAA has a uh, new mapping system out now too that looks at uh, the possibilities of coastal zone inundation from uh, hurricanes or tropical storms. And it can show you um, some different scenarios of what may happen along the shoreline for a category one through four system and, and may help you decide, well, I may have to evacuate or I may not have to. And um, you can look at the shelter in place table to look at uh, where your house is and what you can do to better prepare that home for the effects of a, a hurricane or tropical storm. So it could be that where you live, even though it's a newer home, <laughs> I'm in an impact zone, we gotta go. You wanna realize that now. We are looking for a few heroes. Mentors, trailblazers, innovators. A passion to change lives. Spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds. Help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back. We're talking with Dennis Wang and Darren Okimoto, who wrote Hawaii's handbook about how to prepare your home for natural hazards. We start off talking to Dennis about how to strengthen your home to withstand storms and high winds. We take a look at some of the different protection options available for both single and double wall homes. 
Okay, Dennis, so I'm super excited to finally learn about how to protect my home from high winds. And we're here in Pearl City at a single wall home. Right. And you're gonna tell me about these hurricane clips. Okay, sure. And I'm glad we're at Pearl City because a lot of the houses here are relatively old and they're single wall, which means there's one wall. Typically, it's uh, a redwood tongue and groove board. So if you look at the wall here, there's a little slot sticking out, that's your tongue. And on the other side, there's a slot there, that's your groove. Uh -huh. And they fit in, they're like seven inch panels. That's your typical single wall house and it's common throughout the entire state. One of the first things you recommend for the older houses, and that's houses built before 1988 on Oahu, and the date will vary for each county. It's in the book. The very first thing we recommend is hurricane clips. Here's a H3 hurricane clip. These are probably around 70 or 80 cents at your hardware store. It's a simple installation. It's very important. If you don't have this and there's a tropical storm wind or even a category one or two, it'll lift your roof off, okay? So it's very important to fortify this roof to wall connection. In the homeowner's handbook, mm -hmm. there's a step-by-step -step guide on how to do it. I would say for this house, it took two Saturdays or two or three Saturdays to do. And the benefit is the house is stronger and we got discounts on hurricane insurance oh. related to that. We're here at a double wall home. Right. So I wanted to show what a double wall house is. And I want to explain it from this model, which I call the mini house, <laughs> and this house, okay? So here's the mini house. Here's a simulated roof truss. And then on the roof truss sits on a double top plate. There's essentially two two by fours. Uh -huh. Then there's the studs that go from the roof to the bottom of the house. And there's a sill plate. Okay, so this is your typical double wall house. What we want to do is to actually do a continuous load path connection, tying the roof to the wall and the wall all the way to the foundation. And in the new homeowner's handbook and in our website, there's a demonstration project using structural screws uh. to complete the load path. So here you see, here's the siding, okay? And you built, drilled its structural screw right through the siding. Everywhere you see the rafter coming out and one and a half inch below, that's your connection for the first part the double top plate to the truss. Gotcha. And then we're gonna make another connection for the stud to the base plate. But we plan to add maybe 100 to 200 structural screws into this house. It's gonna make it a lot stronger. Having the load path is one of the key things in survivability of a house, okay? We went to Rockport Texas. after, yeah, after Hurricane Harvey, category four hurricane with the FEMA Building Science Branch for, for a week. And we looked at houses. And, there, and on the same block, there were houses that were totally destroyed and some that were, had no damage at all. And the key things, they had a load path, a strong load path, and window protection and a strong envelope around their house. I see. So that's what we're trying to do with, in the handbook, showing people how to relatively simply add a load path and also to protect their windows and uh, protect the envelope of their house. There's 12 different ways to protect your windows in the handbook. One of the cheapest ways is plywood, mm -hmm. but it's heavy. There's this new material called polycarbonate and they just started bringing it in Hawaii, just as strong as plywood, lightweight. For large or unusually shaped windows, there's hurricane fabric. And this works like netting at a driving range. You know, catches the golf balls, same thing. It catches the windborne debris before it impacts your window. Probably the most expensive, but it's a great investment if you consider that it adds value to your house is impact-resistant glass. This is impact-resistant glass. 
This is what they put in, in Florida under the Florida building codes. It passed a large missile test, nine pound, two by four, going at 34 miles per hour. And then after the impact, they also send it through pressure inward and positive and negative tests where they simulate the different wind directions of a hurricane. No masking tape, no opening windows, which is essentially opening up the envelope uh, around your house. Next, we meet up with Darren Okimoto and his wife Duffy to take a look at how they protect their windows and doors. This house was built in 2007, and it was exactly at the same time that Dennis and I were doing the first version of the homeowner's handbook. And so by doing the homeowner's handbook, that really gave me the opportunity then to really think about you know, what types of um, hurricane hazard preparedness that I could actually install in my house. So with our house, basically what we have is we have 26 windows total, 13 on the upstairs and then 13 on the downstairs. And then uh, my wife and I and my mother live downstairs. So we're responsible for, it, for installing the windows on the downstairs and we leave the upstairs to my sister and her husband. We wanted to do, use something that, light, that was light and actually strong and easy to actually go ahead and install. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up using what are called these aluminum storm panels, which are actually 14 inches in width. And as you can see, they're very light as well. On. Just ratchet and tighten up the bolts like that. So, so how long does it take you to deploy all of your 14 windows? With Duffy and my mother helping, it takes us about two hours to deploy all of the windows downstairs. And how many times do you think you've deployed them since you've lived here? Last year, right, when we had a very active uh, hurricane storm season, we actually ended up deploying them three times. In total, everything cost $27,000 to protect the entire house all of the windows and the doors. So a significant investment. It was a significant investment, but definitely worth it. This is where we stored most of our stone panels. So inside here, it goes by numbers. We have numbers in there, so it, within rooms, and it's better organized and stores very well. Once we have all of our aluminum storm panels up, the question is, so how do you get inside and outside of the house, right? Oh, right, because if you aluminum paneled your front door, you're locked out. You're locked out or, or locked in, right? And so what we decided to do was go with actually the high-end option. Press the button, and the shutter is deployed. Well, this one actually has a manual winch as well on the inside. Well, if the power does go out, we're able to actually raise and lower this manually. And so what we have here is I've already went ahead and installed a hurricane garage door brace. And it's actually this whole strip of aluminum from the base of the floor where, it, where it's screwed in all the way to the top of the garage door. So this is installed. And as you can see, it's, it's bolted actually, you know, bolted to the garage door. What would happen if we didn't secure the garage door in a hurricane? So the garage door would basically blow out. And just like when a window blows out, there'll be more pressure that's inside of the house and put more pressure on the house itself that could actually you know, affect the roof. Hurricane season in the Central Pacific runs from June 1st to November 30th. But storms, high winds, flooding, and tsunamis can happen at any time. The new fourth edition of the Sea Grant Homeowner's Handbook to help you prepare for natural hazards is now online. Check it out and then build a kit, make a plan, and stay informed. Watch episodes online at voiceofthesea.org and follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea.